from the middle is proud to be a founding member of Odd Pods Media. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to episode number 200 and something something of From the Middle. We are three middle class guys sitting in the middle of America, middle chaps are live. Some of it is something we're talking about things that are in the middle, not a political podcast, but instead we are a comedy and culture co- podcast hailing to you from the Midwest. This week, we start off with a couple of fact checks, bringing back an old segment to correct some ills of previous episodes. One fact check featuring Ray Gun. And uh, we talked about kids going back to school. We're talking about martial arts and kids' sports. Uh, we're talking about virtual marathons. Did you know that that was the thing? We found that out today. And then after the break, uh, Dylan confesses some juicy, juicy details about his life and swimming with the loofahs. Um, is Kendall gatekeeping cooking or is he just having an honest conversation of curiosity? And then uh, we talk about some streaming in the back half as well. You're going to enjoy it. Love you guys. <coughs> oh, for the love. Sorry, just clearing my Mountain Dew hole. I got my phone hole clean today. That's where you keep it? You're so cerebral and you're so developed and evolved. Sometimes I wish I could share with all the middlers some of the things we talk about before we click record. It's fun yeah. times over here. These days we delay alien. I would say we would only alienate half of you, but then in the next sentence we would probably alienate the other half. And uh that's fair. And that'd be it. I don't think we can even use that term anymore because it upsets aliens. So mm. it's problematic. What would it be like to be canceled by everyone? That's a good question. I know some people that know. I mean, not personally, but we can. Yeah. There are examples. Let's ask yeah. Rosie O'Donnell. <laughs> yeah. Ray Gun. Um, um, oh, speaking of Ray Gun, I need to fact check myself on that one. Okay, let's do it. I need to come clean on something. Fact so last- check. Fact check. From the middle. Fact check. So, <laughs> it's actually kind of a funny method by which I was deceived. Um, there is, uh, and the, the whole story is still not known here, but so I'll, I'll preface it with that. However, uh, I had mentioned that Ray Gunn and her husband were in charge of this organization that was, that was, uh, charged with coming up with Olympic qualifiers out of, uh, Australia and, um, do, do oh, well, I'll just say this, that came from, <laughs> a group of Australians who put a petition together to get Reagan and whoever else was involved to apologize to like the Olympic committee and to Australia and everything, because they were so embarrassed by her performance. And, but apparently uh, she and her husband were not in fact in charge of this organization. It looks more as if she won the thing fair and square there are other theories out there that get more into psychology about who she is to the breaker community in Australia and how it could be like a more of like, we just, we love her so much and she's got so much passion and drive and she's done all of this groundwork for the breaker community, not by being a breaker herself, but like on the other end of things, promoting and advancing and everything. So like, of course we want her to go to the Olympics. So there's some thoughts like maybe that's how she ended up getting in. Do I don't think anybody watches that and thinks to themselves that Australia is so behind in the culture of breakdancing that that was the best they could have sent. Mm. I, I don't think any of us actually believe that. So there's got to be something else maybe going on. That's how I feel. Maybe Australia is that far behind. I don't know. But there are plenty of other countries that you would not expect to be good at breaking and 100 percent of them were better than ray gun so <laughs> um dang it ai fooled us again yeah 
Well, I, 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 I'm as I've done reading in the internet, as we all know, is the best place to gather credible information. Mm, absolutely. Um, you weren't the first person to have that theory, obviously, or to have heard that theory. And so that's clearly one of the more popular ones that she was in charge of some gating community, gating uh, function or organization uh, to get in there. Anyway, it's just crazy. It was just, it was just so the Internet's having so much fun, <laughs> <clears throat> so much fun with it. There was a UFC fighter who won her fight and part of her celebration dance was the the weird kangaroo thing. Like people are like mimic it, mimicking. It. You know it's going to be on the football field this year. I was just going to say if EA doesn't put that into Madden and college football as an end zone celebration, they really missed out. Like Indeed. it's just prime and ready to be mocked. And indeed. I will say hey, Ray Gun because I'm sure at some point you're going to listen to this. Sure. Um this is all going to blow over in two or three months. It's going to be fine. Your friends in Australia are still your friends in Australia. And uh, you're still who you are to that breaking dancing community. And that will not change. Don't try sand effect yourself. Just laugh it off and let it blow over. It's not that important. The Olympics are done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. La laugh with us. Yeah, just we're not going to stop. So you might as well. Yeah. And what that could look like is just flopping around on the floor in weird That's ways. Right. A like lot a, like you're dancing. Um, yeah, a dog with an itch on its back. Like it's. <laughs> is this like in the office where Michael tries to make fun of himself to get everyone to quit making fun of him? And then he actually hurts his own feelings and goes too far. <laughs> is that I can just imagine her trying to do that. Like she laughs so hard that it's like over the top. And then she hurts her own feelings. Well, speaking of follow-ups from last week, I had shared with you guys uh, super exciting news that the Hot Ones Challenge is, in fact, going to happen. I shared that one of our dear friends uh, for my birthday got me the Season 24 10-pack. And I said he invited himself to participate. What I meant was, by giving this gift, he has surely earned himself a seat at the Hot Ones Challenge table. That's what I meant. He didn't literally. So I'm just correcting my how I you know what I meant. But, you know, yeah, it's yeah, yeah. And then well, I asked I you guys. That's how but, I understood it before. we yeah. said it. So then I asked you guys, should I buy the original Da Bomb? There's a there's a spinoff version of Da Bomb as sauce number eight, which is typically the hottest one. And then it kind of trails off from there if you follow the show. And you guys were like, no, just let it be. It's own. Well, I bought it anyway. So I <laughs> I got <laughs> the original De Bomb Beyond Insanity sauce number eight. In case we want to try it, it was less than $12 on Amazon.com. So I thought, why the heck not? So we've got it. You guys want to. Did you? I, I, did, I was not aware of this. So sauce number eight is the is the hottest of the sauces? Well, almost in almost every episode, they the guests agree that De Bomb, which is the eighth sauce ends up being the hottest and then one more and then the last dab okay and the, and to, for the last two they're always like that was way hotter the bomb was way hotter than those last two okay so even if the scoville units don't miss make don't jive could be other other factors other factors chemical of why, reactions, which is very yes, possible of why they say the bomb was way hotter than the last two so that anyway. makes a little more sense on a recent episode they had um uh, this is where I fumble over myself trying to think of actors' names. So I'm just going to say Wolverine and Deadpool uh, were on together. And when they did the last dab, um, Ryan Reynolds, ha, I got one. Hugh Jackman. Insisted, insi and, yeah, and Hugh Jackman insisted that they, that they last dabbed, would last dab the bomb onto the, uh, the final wing. And they did. That is what they did. And Oof. they got through it. That was a particularly funny episode because of those two. And, you know, they're like Martin Short and Steve Martin. It's they're just when they get together, it's it's just jabbing at each other the whole time. And uh, it's funny to, to see that in that context. I need to check that one out. Yes. And multiple people have said the order is wrong. The bomb needs to be the last one. But I think yeah. there's. 
some intentionality to like letting it cool off a little in the peak of the show being three fourths of the way through and sort of letting sure. it. Yeah. Anyway. Um, so I got it, uh, is the, is the important piece. And, uh, what I think we're going to do and tell me what you guys think about this is just go into a place like, uh, wing stop and not wing street. Good Lord. No, their wings are garbage wing stop and saying, you just cook us up a bunch of, naked bone in wings we'll toss the sauces and that way they're freshish mm -hmm. and line them up and film it yeah Let's then do we it. don't have to do the cooking yeah no we, I, I don't think there is any iteration where we're going to do the cooking <laughs> so mean, that's exciting we just need to find things. a we just need to find a saturday that works uh so what is this? The first full week of school for for everybody? Yes, sir. Exciting times. I've got two. My two oldest are in the same high school together for the first time, obviously, uh, which is exciting. And little man is is uh, off at school, and he started uh, jujitsu while I was on my last work trip. So he's had two. Nice. He had two trial visits to jujitsu. And tonight was my first time seeing him. So it was his third visit. He's officially started now. And I got to see the, is it a dojo? The, uh, the, the school. Different places use different things. It depends on how weird they want to be about it. Yeah. We're, the, mid I, we're the Midwest. It's a dojo. It's fine. Yeah. Dojo. I yeah. mean, a lot of them will just call it a studio. Like studio. It, for our kids is Taekwondo class. Like you would never hear them call it a dojo or anything else. Classroom. They, they call it a studio. It was really fun. Kendall, I know this is old, old, uh, you know, this is not a new experience for you, rather, but it was really fun. It's like stereotypical one walls, the mirror, got the blue mat, got the wooden weapons on the wall, black and white photos of martial arts masters throughout history, yeah. <laughs> belts hanging in one corner. Uh, it was just really fun watching them. So this is junior Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. So it's uh, nine to 15 year olds. Um, this, uh, studio offers also karate and other martial arts and stuff and a Bra Brazilian jujitsu for older kids and adults, but it was really fun watching them, uh, learned how to shrimp out, uh, was what they call like making your body in the shape of a shrimp to like kick out if somebody's on top of you and has the upper hand or upper position and how to get guard. And I was like getting pretty fired up. I was like, I could see myself doing this. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, so I now know why you and you and Amy got into it. It's fun watching them. It's fun watching them. And there's a big part of you that wants to like, I wonder, I wonder if I could, like, it looks like I could do this. Mm -hmm. So now jujitsu and Taekwondo are two different worlds. But very different. Very different worlds. One, like it, jujitsu is more, I wouldn't say either one of them are practical, but um, Taekwondo is far more about like, it's a sport of form and, and and balance and things of that nature jujitsu is a little bit more like wrestling yep based on the premise that something like 80 percent of street fights are going to end up on the ground so yeah if you learn how to maneuver yourself on the ground or use your opponent in their motion against them how to get out of and protect yourself less about striking kicking and punching and more about ground combat grappling and getting out of ground situations. Yeah. I like to think of, of like, cause that contrasts with, I like to think of Taekwondo is to street fighting of what like Epi is to like actual weapons fighting. Right. Yeah. Like it's not just get it out of your mind that you're learning self-defense because that's not what Taekwondo is about. They don't like they and they'll tell you that like they're not concerned so much with that. But anyway, but he's going to get the little gi and he's going to yeah, work dude. his way through the belts. And I'm like, let's go. This is fun. I'm in it. That is fun. <laughs> that is. Fun. So, yeah, really cool. Shout out to Summit Martial Arts in Delaware. And uh, it's going to be fun. I'm excited to watch him go through this. He's like, I want this to be my sport. And I'm like, all right, man, I'm a little martial <laughs> yeah. artist. Yeah, dude. Yeah, dude. I like that uh, they ask, like, what are your goals for your child? Like when you're sort of signing them up, like, is it a confidence thing? Is it a 
you just want them to do something physical and quit playing video games? Are they struggling at school? Do they struggle with authority? Is this like you want them to have some authority in their life? They kind of ask you like what the goals are, right? Assassin. <laughs> yeah, mm. exactly. And I think for Case Man, you guys have met him. He's just a sweet kid. And I don't want the world to take advantage of his sweetness. And I want him to stay sweet. But I want him to also be able to have a little more confidence, be just a tad more assertive, not aggressive. Because he's already said, Dad, I don't really like the aggressive sports. Uh, and that could change. But as of right now, he just wants to do something that's a little more giving you confidence in being defensive and being mm -hmm. assertive. And I kind of like that about it. And like, I love that they like bow when they get on the mat and they bow to the flag, they bow to the sensei before they do anything. Like there is some discipline and some routine and some stuff in there. But yeah, so far, I think it's going to be really good for him. Yeah. Well, there's a respect too, like yeah. built into the martial arts, a, a respect for like your opponent and, and, and things of that nature. So it's not like football where you line up a get across from somebody and you're taught to like, you know, envision the person you hate the most and now go after them. Destroy kind of them. It's, it's not that the martial arts, all of them are, this is somebody that you have spent years with training and you love and respect this person. And then even if it is somebody that you've never met before at a tournament, it's the same kind of thing. It's you're there for business and you score your points and then you shake hands and your buddies afterward. Like it's, it's more of that kind of thing. Which I, yeah, totally saw that even after watching for one time, the kid that was helping him case is nine. He's a tall nine, but he's nine. The kid helping him was 14. That's who he got paired up with. One of the older kids yeah. in the class and the kids like on top of him, and he's like showing him the moves. And he would say, were the instructions from sensei clear is there anything i can help you with okay now watch your your hand should be like this when we do this it was like he's helping them and then at the end of class they line up and they shake sensei's hand and then every kid that just shakes sensei's hand stands in line and gets their hand shook and so everybody's shaking hands and it's like a little train that gets built and it's like great job today great job today and i was like that's yeah. so cool yeah so it's, just, it's it's highly physical and aggressive but it's not angry yeah it's just funny not funny fun and and since it's from the middle this is my centrist point of view on uh observing for the first time it's kind of cool kind of cool seeing it so um how's first days first weeks going for you guys go ahead dylan so far so good the the big news which i think we shared last week was uh chatting through Lunch is free for all the kids in my yeah. daughter's elementary school. <clears throat> She's made it clear she wants to eat at home, which is fine. And then she continues to make it clear that she wants to eat at home, which is still fine. And then she makes it clear that she just wants to eat at home, which continues to be fine. But we explained to her that it's an option. So in, in a situation where, let's say you eat breakfast and then you get to school and you're still very, very hungry, it's okay to go eat the free breakfast if you really want. And that's fine. So we're working through that. And then there's a barcode for free breakfast. And then there's a passcode for lunch. And so it's very techie. So she's learning the whole process. And it's good. She uh, she is having fun at recess. She likes that her special classes are at the end of the day. And um, yeah, we got, the, we got a calendar with the like a magnet for the fridge with all the lunches. And then they just rotate through the weeks. It's probably normal. I don't know. But we took tiny little post-it notes on the days with food she doesn't like and just wrote pack and stuck it on top of those on the magnet. So it's very oh, easy organized. for her to know which days she wants to pack and which days she wants to buy things. Uh, so we're very organized. And uh, so far, so good. And uh, no complaints. We're still, uh, still very early, but I'm sure it'll be a great year. Yeah. It's exciting. She hasn't been disillusioned yet. No, she still <laughs> enjoys it. Yeah. She still loves going to school. Yeah, it is excited to see people and learn things, which will all be dashed soon enough, but not yet. So we're going to let her keep leaning into the enjoyment. Yeah, I find that third grade is where they start wising up to the fact that you're sending them off to learn things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it no longer becomes exciting. So. So, how yeah, are, how are your kids faring, Kendall? I oh. know it's not your favorite part of life, sending them back to school, but. There they are. How are they doing? 
they're doing they're doing fine. They're doing swell. It's uh it's just a little bit more of a of a you know, you you've got to get them up in the morning and prod them along to get them off to school. Um, which, you know, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, like they're excited about it at those ages. And now they're not <laughs> anymore. Um but even at that, we've had we've had uh, success this year, more so than last year. Um, we we have had some issues with one of our kiddos with anxiety and um, and not not wanting to go to school, and it we expect that to pop up at certain points during the year, but we like leaned in heavily on talking through that and and spelling out you know, expectations and, and things of that, that nature and, um, got ahead of it, I think a little better this year than before to where the school year has kicked off swimmingly. It's Good. gone, it's gone well. That's awesome. So, and at the same time, we are, Isaac has his first fall baseball game this week. They've been practicing for a couple of weeks and Joel one of the twins starts soccer practice this week. And then I've been taking Lydia to open gyms uh, for basketball on Saturday mornings the last couple of weeks. And we're going to continue doing that through this month. And then, and then it'll be time to start signing up for, Ooh. I think there's a tryout that we're going to, uh, to walk her through. And then a fallback league that we'll probably end up actually doing. So here we go. When it Buckle starts, it starts. Yeah, so, having three is no joke. The uh, but the, the overlap is small, and uh, baseball and soccer are only overlapping because we're letting Isaac do fall baseball, right? Um, otherwise, it wouldn't overlap at all. Soccer will be done by the time basketball actually starts, but it's just you've, we're thinking ahead through it now. Um. So we won't have very many calendar conflicts among the sports. Um, but it does at the same time feel like we're dealing with them all at the same time right now. So yeah, so I'm that. seeing some I'm seeing some of my mom friends uh and just post the whole like uh 6 30 dinner number one, 9 30, dinner number two. <laughs> With like hashtag all the sports, all the school stuff starting all at once. It's just like a rude awakening back to what can be a crazy time for some. And they only have two. Uh, but soccer and peewee football or junior high football. And uh, yeah, it's a lot. Yeah. Those definitely overlap. So we thought it was going to be easy last year having all three of them doing the same sport in the fall. And it wasn't we should have known because they're you know they weren't all on the same team and so that means they're all on different schedules but all at the exact same time season time frame that was a lot that was a lot to do is that a good application uh for the phrase herding cats does that work there uh are you sure times yeah, I always like that phrase. I feel like it doesn't get used enough. The imagery really sells it when you start thinking about it. If it doesn't apply, that's fine. But it doesn't. I think of herding cats as being more along the lines of you're trying to get people to do things and they're just not paying attention. Mm, yeah, that makes sense. One of the old companies I worked for did a herding cats Super Bowl commercial. It got quite popular where they're like, it's these cowboys around a fire at night and they're sharing their stories from the day and they've got lint rollers. <laughs> <laughs> and they're yeah. actually hurting cats i think it was eds love just hurting cats super bowl commercial that's yeah. what that's what helped makes it it's like the comedian who just keeps drilling a joke down further and further so that less people get it but the people that do think it's funnier it's like the lint roller is just the extra layer to the joke yeah that yeah. just helps sell it it makes it funnier that's great yeah uh fun times um 
That's why well, it can get crazy. And I kind of like something that Sensei, I feel weird calling him. I know him because he's in my men's ministry group. So I just want to call him Charles. But I feel like in around the kids, I got to call him Sensei. Anyway, Sensei said that one of the cool things that they do is like, hey, we get it. If a kid's getting like going to start another sport and wants to push pause on the membership to, to jujitsu, just resume when he's done and things calm down. We'll pick up right where he left off. Like there's no... They turn it on and off as you please. I was like, that's kind of a cool, like no hard feelings. If you got to do what you got to do and things get a little crazy. So, yeah, that's great. That's great. Cause otherwise like that, that goes all year. There isn't a season. Exactly. Yeah. Having a season helps. Yeah. I'm just playing this in the background while we keep talking, but here's the hurting cats. And commercial. <laughs> 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 They're just running over the hill. So good. <laughs> what else is going on, guys? So school's starting. Uh, mud run. My family did a mud run yesterday. Um, I did not partake in this in this mud run. Um, Corey has started. <laughs> They're crossing a river with cats. <laughs> sneezing. Cats. The guy's sneezing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry, I just. Uh, I love it. I love it. Good. And, and, you know, flannel and cats probably doesn't mix well. There you go. So guess. the mud run. Uh, yeah, it, which which is just fun. The kids come back all nasty. Amy comes back all crazy. They hose you off at the end, which has to be a fun experience. I wasn't there. I wish I had more stories about the mud run, but it, it makes me chuckle and laugh just like imagining them doing a mud run and going down slides crawling through mud under ropes and things and whatever else it is they do i imagine that it's hilarious to watch um but that's uh that's all i got i i i'm definitely missing out on the mud run thing hmm. are do you though costumes do people do costumes for those like do they dress up like vikings and like lean into it that way not that i I've heard, and I guess I, I've seen back in the days that I did social media. I remember people having some kind of themed costume that they would that they would have for something of that nature. Um, my family doesn't. They literally like go and find shoes at Goodwill that they could wear just for this purpose, um, because it's not uncommon to lose a shoe in a mud run, and uh, and so we. I tied everybody's shoes on real tight before they left. So that way, hopefully they didn't lose a shoe just for the sheer fact that it would be miserable to have to go through the rest of a mud run without a shoe. Um, but yeah, I started telling that and I have no stories about it. So a guy goes up to his rabbi. and says, <laughs> Well, it got me thinking. So I'm not. So we've talked about uh, our comedic disdain for like cycling people yeah like can not all but some running people in the running community mm -hmm. well there's this growing trend that i think was born during COVID about these virtual races and these virtual runs where I about this so one of them might be the road to hana is a popular road along the north shore of maui and so there's a road to hana run and you're committing you sign up just like you would any other race and you're committing to over the course of so many days logging this many miles and with your entry fee you get mailed to you a medal that says i ran the road to hana 5k 10k whatever i don't know whatever the distance is t-shirt and all um, and then they have them for like geek stuff. So I just saw one in my feed this week. It was six awesome looking Star Wars medals. And one was like Tatooine and one was like uh, Hoth and one was like, and they're like really elaborate medals that you ran virtually these six Star Wars locales because you signed up for the the, the miles or the total miles in one or a given number of increments and you did it 
how do we feel about this? But you didn't. You didn't do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I feel like a... there's ways that you could do this better. Yeah, yeah. I'm doing a virtual run right now. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's except you're actually running. Mm. I feel like I need Sherry to come in and come in and talk about this because she's the one. Yeah. I'm not mocking the virtual races. Tell us how it works. Oh, tell us how it works. Hold on. Hey guys, special guest on special guest on the podcast. Hold on a second. I'm not making fun. I'm asking how they feel. Okay. It's so it's also to learn more about where you're going. Okay. That you get the app and you journey along and you learn about special things about history or uh, things they're known for. Like you go through this whole journey and learn facts about the places. Are you doing That's it? With, I did the road to Hana. Are you, to the road to Hana. are you doing it with other people or do you have to certain you amount? People, you can see their progress. You get to like hear people's stories. People post photos of like, I'm doing this for weight loss. Here's where I'm at now. Or like, I just had surgery six months ago. This is part of my recovery or like people share their stories along the way. You see their plots. And do you way. have a span of time that you have to do it inside yeah. of? You can set a goal and say, I want to do it in X amount of days. So what was the distance for the road to Hana run? 70 miles. And my goal was to do it in eight weeks. And I did it in six. So you could take a year to do it if you wanted. Yeah. They have one that's over 2000 miles. There's one that's called like the road of Jesus or something. And you, you journey through like all these places. They have tons of them. Really cool, really cool ones, but they've just started adding movies. So like they just added Harry Potter. So they're starting to do these whole collections of things that you can, it's, yeah. But the actual one, yeah. The actual locations are legit awesome. You can do Rome, Banff, Canada. You can do places in Africa, South America. And you learn about the country. You learn about the place. I'm just bringing it up as a cultural phenomenon. And making muffins. And I hear you mocking. <laughs> oh, my head. I'm not mocking. I'm I'm asking their thoughts on a cultural phenomenon. A trend. Nope. Um, no day. muffins for you. <laughs> no muffins for me. I'll share a photo of the medal. I would love your thoughts. So, so. First of all, Corey, how dare you? Yeah, the gall, you know. How dare I? <sighs> Go now, so we can talk. Okay, so there's, we're live. So there's actually there there is people are actually running. They're actually running. They're, they're just actually not, they're committing just, to the distances. We've now learned that they have as much time as they want to complete that distance. Sure. And as long as you you check the box, I did it. Mm -hmm. You get the metal so you could cheat you could absolutely cheat there's nothing keeping you from cheating okay. one of our friends uh james james did one okay. and it's like i think it was like from a cool geek culture uh i think it was star wars or harry potter he did like a cool one and he's got like an awesome i did the rebel run whatever did they have uh real or computer generated footage like from a GoPro that you could like watch the path of the run. Like somebody actually runs the real ones with like a camera. So you can like hit play while you're running on the watch your iPad and then like see what the path looks like. Or like Let's one of the fancy that. treadmills that have like the big screen and yeah. And that's yeah, what I, I was thinking when you were talking about a virtual run. I was thinking of that. Yeah, yeah, I don't think it's like a Peloton feature where you're like looking at the scenery as you go by because some of these locations are made up, right? Harry Potter, Star Wars. These are fake. Some would have to be created. Like there's this the Disney Plus Star Wars screensavers that are like fake hot, but you can as if you're watching the screensaver of the thing. Mm -hmm. I think you open your app, you click I'm starting my run, and it's like today we're gonna learn about Black Sands Beach, just off the road to Hana. Black Sands Beach is a popular beach for tourists because of its actual black sand. The black sand is caused by the lava rock that breaks down over time. It's like I feel like the next layer is the ability to have that audio over a video of somebody doing the actual real places so you can watch it on a TV or iPad while you're running if you run at home. And you you can do the audio if you just want to listen. Okay. Or you I'm can share my screen. Okay. okay guys, here's the this, this is why you should follow us on YouTube.
So do you guys see? Yeah. Um, so okay. these are the these are the different conqueror virtual challenge the the six challenges so anyone can get these medals yeah except chewbacca but anybody else and they're like look at the medals look how cool they're animated they have moving components to them mm, that is cool you just gotta there you go so th that's like an app the screenshot of the app so it's got a little today you're gonna run this section of the pod race okay race. do these have uh a tracker on them that you're aware of like a gps like it, you have to have gps available no so idea. it knows that you're going the distance that you're saying you're going. so much to learn we need our middlers <laughs> because i was going to say like one could do this on a treadmill one could cheat in the way that, like, you know, maybe they'll do it on an exercise bike instead. Or maybe you can row your way through. Whoa. Sorry, I just got to the prices. Any three of those six that I just shared, $134. Okay. Uh, if you want to do all six for the complete bundle, $224. Or a single challenge is 50 bucks. So let's just look at what all six gets you. You get your entry and a premium medal free, five entries in the medals for 10% off, access to 325K private Facebook group, 84 virtual postcards, collectibles, local spots, 30 trees will be planted because of this, 6X digital certificate certificates of completion, and plant 30 real trees or stop 300 plastic bottles from entering the ocean. Okay, at log in and see your progress on the uh, iPhone or Android. Choose your own time frame. Pick your start date and choose how many weeks you'd like to set as your goal. Exercise types, you can do it as a team or solo. So I don't think there's any actual tracking. I think this is all just, this is what you should do today if you said you want to go this distance in this amount of time. Yeah. Hmm. Sounds like the perfect activity while eating muffins. Yeah, people are people are totally going to take it. I'm so of uninformed. I don't know anything. This is just <laughs> this is just my. I just know it's a thing. So I'm gonna I'm gonna run the Seine River that cuts through the heart of Paris as a part of the Olympic virtual 10k or 300 mile race, and I'm gonna take this many months years to do it, and I'm yeah. gonna get an Eiffel Tower thing that i can hang that sounds offensive <laughs> <laughs> okay sin river so anyway uh sin somebody else bring up something <laughs> this actually feels like a great spot to no longer be offended and hear from some of our friends at odd pods media oh. if you like fun then you're gonna love the beard out podcast it's a podcast where we talk about two of the greatest things in the world, beer and Weird Al. And frankly, we talk more about Weird Al than anything because he's the gift that keeps on giving. So join us as we talk through Weird Al's career, what he means to us, and we have some very special guests on to discuss the magic. That is Alfred Matthew Yankovic. Weird Al, part of the Odd Pods Media Network. So I learned something new this week. And sometimes, as an adult, you can think that you're kind of smart. And then you learn something that you feel like you should have known for a really long time. And then you don't feel so smart. And so, I'm going to say a truism. You just realize as an adult sometimes that you don't know what you don't know. And if somebody didn't teach you a certain thing growing up, uh, or as an adult then you just don't know it. And this week I learned that loofahs are a plant. <laughs> like, a, like a thing that grows from the earth and that the plastic ones in your shower are mimicking real plant, a real, a real <laughs> thing from the earth yeah, yeah. that the earth produces. And I had no idea. I thought that some beauty company somewhere designed the loofah because they thought a sponge was ugly and they kind of tried to come up with a fancy sounding French Seine River offensive name like loofah and 
that they just wanted something fancy sounding. And now I know that a loofah is a plant and it looks kind of like corn and you can slice them and use them as sponges. And I had no idea. Did you guys know this, that they're, that's a plant and not just a shower? Am I the only idiot? Well, did. yeah, but but I mean, the only reason why I knew was because, like, I go shopping and I see them in stores, and then at some point I looked at it and was like, "Oh, that doesn't look like any other loofahs I know of." And then I look at the thing and it says it's a natural loofah or a real loofah, and I was like, "Oh, okay." I had no idea. I'm only familiar with the bacteria magnet that is the plastic one, and I was not aware of the naturally occurring one. And I feel dumb because of it, but here we are. And I'm willing to admit it because we all learn things as adults. Um, I had no idea. I guess I'm the only one. Maybe other people didn't. And I want to know if anyone's ever, I don't know. Can you use, see, this is all new. And I didn't even like look this up to educate myself. I just came on here to make myself sound like an idiot with no more research. Do people use the natural loofahs on their body or do those only get are those only like dishes to like scrub dishes and clean things yeah i think for the like i've seen them like in the beauty sections and the where you would go to buy your plastic loofahs sometimes they like I, I specifically remember seeing them hanging on like yeah hanging next to no clue i think like fancier um fancier not hotels i guess i don't i'm not a spa guy but like i've seen in spa culture or fancier sections of stores you'll see the fancier gift baskets of things where you would see natural uh loofahs and and whatnot but yeah i love when you uh, i love those i was today years old when i learned that yeah. loofahs were real and there's so much and and look i i recognize the value of growing up in a small town <laughs> in a rural area there's benefits to that and then there are some costs and there's some things that i just took me a long time to figure out my <laughs> wife has a different background than me and for years she would mention the name of a store that i had never heard of and i would say what do they sell and where does that rank amongst the similar types of stores like she would say von mar and i'd say what's von mar and she would say they have like clothes and stuff. And I'm like, is that worse than Macy's or better than Macy's? Because that's my point of reference. I have no idea. And so these things come up and I frequently just have to ask questions, um, no matter how dumb I sound. But I learned things. And uh, this was one of those weeks where I definitely learned something. Uh, did you guys have any of those like things that and I don't mean like the stuff that's in like you know, health class in fourth grade that you're learning about genders. We all have those conversations. I just mean like, like stores and products, just things you never, it's the denubulizer all over again, just things that you don't even know that exists mm -hmm. that I'm this many years old. And I just had no clue. I didn't know what neti pots were until I was married. Never even heard of the practice nor the tool, even though again, like, I had been in, in many a uh, sinus and allergy section and just never took note of the neti pots that were there. I feel like I only know because in the office, Dwight tries to take the teapot and pour it in his, like he's going to pour it in his nose. I feel yeah. like that's the only reason I know. I feel like there's a lot of those uh, home body gadgets, like the, 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 the pet egg. Like, oh, you can scrape the skin off of your feet with like a cheese grater for your feet instead of just picking mm -hmm. at it like i do oh like you can do it like a healthy normal way yeah uh <laughs> instead of doing it until you bleed oh i didn't know that was <laughs> well you can use the pet egg till you bleed it's sure <laughs> more of a challenge there's a reason it says don't use this right after a shower when your skin's soft because <laughs> that is a concern there's but a lot yeah. of those little, there's a lot of those little, like kitchen is a great place for those little th gadgets mm -hmm. that you're like, I never knew I needed that. Now I have to have one of those things. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, little, little cool tools, gadgets for the, the toolbox that you're like, I have to have one of those now. Like a little, like a little thing when you're trying to do like finishing nails or brads by hand with a little tiny hammer, like a, mm -hmm. there's a little tool that will hold that with a magnet. So you don't have to have your fingers anywhere near that. 
Mm. And I was like, that's so smart. It's like a little fork that holds the the little finishing nail. So you can, I'm like, that's got to have one of those. Yeah. Yeah. We were in a kitchen gadget family growing up and, uh, and generally I cook, but I use the same couple utensils for everything, regardless of how practical or impractical it is to use them. And Brie asked the other day, where's the mandolin in the kitchen? And I said, what's that word? You just said, <laughs> yeah, because that's, that's a weird place thinking. to put a mandolin. So I'm thinking clearly I misheard the word because what I think you said doesn't go in the room you just said. So I'm <laughs> something is wrong. Something. Yeah. And I heard the word right, but I think it's like a slicer, like you would slice like cucumbers on a like a thing that I d- I still don't really know, but I'm guessing based on her description. Yeah. So out of curiosity, th- this leads me to a follow-up question, this one mm-hmm. specifically. Mm-hmm. So you say you say you cook. Mm-hmm. What what is it you cook? But this feels like a trick question. Is it's this- not so here's what I'm wondering. If you okay. were to make if you wanted to make spaghetti. Uh-huh. There's, I feel like a few different levels there. There is, you could get a frozen spaghetti dish and microwave it. Mm-hmm. You could boil dry spaghetti pasta and then use like ragu jar sauce. Mm-hmm. You could use the dry pasta, but then make like a bolognese sauce or something mm-hmm. from scratch. Mm-hmm. Um, or you could like make pasta, you're like make the pasta yourself mm-hmm. and run it through a pasta cutter yourself mm-hmm. and then like mill your own tomatoes from your garden. Like sure. what what level of cooking is is Dylan? On well, that? see, I have a job. So right. For me, and I know you do too. That wasn't saying you don't. But for me, I'm a oh, bad- I'm not I'm not the extreme on that one. I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to get you. This is general. No, no, curiosity. I know. I know I'm saying for all of we all have jobs and for all of us that uh, you it's striking the balance of convenience and taste uh, versus like quality. Right. So there's sure. some balance there. So when I say cook, it's somewhere in the middle of the things you said. So I'm not going to make my own noodles and I'm not buying the cheapest like crappy sauce but I'll try different ones and look for really good ones. And then typically we'll grab a few, like most as you're in your pasta example, a lot of sauces might need a little extra seasoning. So I'm cooking box noodles. I'm trying to source a better sauce because that's a lot of the flavor. I'm probably adding some seasoning to flavor. I might get like some shaved Parmesan or something to put on it. If I want something a little different than just um, regular Parmesan. So somewhere in the middle, I don't, you know, okay. I don't, uh, I can get really good um, quinoa microwave rice from Costco in bulk. So instead of like making my own rice, that's just so much easier. And the portion is already pretty good. So I can like mm-hmm. just heat up one of the, so is it cooking, cooking? No, I'm not, I'm not, I don't, I don't have a restaurant. I'm not, you know, people aren't asking me to make them foods when they have surgery that they can freeze and eat later because they're so delicious. It's not that level. Right. I'm not making other people dishes like that, but it's also not just like I'm heating up, you know, you're pulling something out of the freezer and popping it in a microwave. It's right. Like yeah. I, Would I you use, consider that I use the oven. I use an air fryer, you know, I'll, I use a grill. I have a grill that I'll grill. I'll cook things and do veggies and throw some different sauces and seasonings and cook meat. Yeah. And, buy nice ingredients relative to me. Right. So, yeah. but I like fast, so I'm willing to compromise a little bit on quality and flavor if it's fast, but not so much that it's junk and just doesn't taste good. True. I don't know if that answers the question. No, it does. And it's not an important question. I can't no. be clear enough about that. Uh, and this is, I an think, important listen, podcast. even if it was pulling something out of the freezer and putting it in the microwave, like yeah. that in my world, that is still cooking. So that's fair. Uh, so, but in the, and as you get more toward the extreme on the spaghetti and sauce example, the more surprised I would be that you had not heard of a mandolin. Yeah. And that's, I don't, I guess that's kind of my point. I think what, I think what I'm, I'm circling back to is ultimately is that 
we didn't have a lot of kitcheny gadgets. I don't feel like so. You know, we we didn't use the the ground beef masher tool. We just you use the same spatula that you were going to stir the whole thing with, right? To yeah. like mash it. You use like the one pairing knife to cut everything. So like I we I wouldn't have pulled out a mandolin to slice cucumbers and then grab a paring knife to do that. You just, you used the one. You, you learned how to do it the old fashioned way. The one thing does yeah. all the things. I'm and, with you. Yeah. So that's the, so I'm a simple some skills. Thing. I'm a Alton I'm Brown. A Alton Brown, who is a TV cook. Yeah. Has a famous term that he coined, which is unitaskers. And he has so much disdain for unitaskers. So like the, the the thing that you had mentioned, there's like the thing that has like the five fins that come off of it that people use because it's so much easier to break up my ground beef with it. Yeah. That's the kind of thing that he would that he firmly has the opinion nobody ever should own that tool. It yeah. is a waste of drawer space and a waste of money. Get a freaking wooden spoon like everybody else. It's not that hard. Do you know how hard that thing is to clean? By the way, <laughs> yeah, it highly impressive. You got to get. In between every one of those fins with the you little guys are anti dishwasher over there. So they... <laughs> yeah, over, it's crazy. <laughs> there's an easier way. <laughs> well, my rule is if I can lick it clean and you don't see any spots, it's probably clean enough, you know. <laughs> well, that would probably explain some of your hot spotting if you're licking the, the ground beef. <laughs> if that term is new to you, check out last week's episode or two weeks ago. Yeah, you can guess what it is. Actually, just fine. <laughs> you don't need to. I mean, go back, but you don't need to go back. But you could go back. But Some yeah. of those unitaskers are just so fun to look at, though. And the as seen on TV feature, my favorite is the thing that you put hard boiled eggs in that have a little hollowed out section, and it's just wires, and it just perfectly cuts through your hard boiled egg, and then oh, you can turn it yeah. ninety degrees and do it the other way, and then sprinkle that on your salad. Yeah. But, the problem with those kind of things, the unitaskers, as you're calling it. That's them, such a great term. It's a great term. I feel like those were invented for the people that are really into the problem that it solves. Mm -hmm. But then they're marketed as if every kitchen has to have them. Exactly. And so the hard boiled egg thing is for the people that do two dozen hard boiled eggs every week and they eat all of them and they make more and they like them on salads and they like them in whatever. And they just, cause that's their thing. And they do that all the time. They're it's famous for bringing the egg salad to the church yeah. potluck. <laughs> and they're like, yes. it always looks so perfect. How do you do it? And their secret is the, is the unitasker at home that does the egg thing. And, but, but then you go to bed, bath and beyond and you're registering for your wedding or a thing. And they're telling you, you gotta have this gadget and gadget and gizmo. And yeah. Who's it's and what's it's galore. That's right. Oh there are so many tools out there to cut watermelon. <laughs> it's like, cut. come on people. No. I, I am. He has taught me to be anti unitasker yeah. as well. I get it. I'd be sitting there with a three inch paring knife. So, you know, what do I um, know? <laughs> that'd be a fun thing to come back with some of your favorite uh, non unitasker things that you're like, this is a must have for everybody for yeah. the kitchen, for the garage, for the whatever. Yeah, that's, that's true. Fun. That's a good one. Things that you learned about that you didn't even know that you needed. Indeed. Um, I watched a movie. Let's talk about it and get into this episode, this week's I... episode, the segment. What are we streaming? <laughs> so I watched Tetris on Apple TV Plus. Have you guys watched Tetris? Ah, Dylan, you have. Have you talked about it? I think I did long ago, but go again. OK, yeah, you, 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 came came out like a year ago. Yeah. Um. And it was one of the, like I was searching for something, anything to watch, and got into that. And uh, man, I thought it was so Tetris. It's it's about the licensing rights, a capitalist in America trying to obtain licensing rights to the game Tetris. Um, and it's uh, it's one of those based on a true story kind of things, but it's not a documentary. Uh, and so I'm sure there was some liberty with some of the stuff that made it a good movie. 
but like I feel like it does it does a good job of of not ignoring some of the setting. So I mean it's it's happening like during Cold War Soviet Union um stuff and there is this this uh capitalist who is like getting shocked and awed at like the communist world um like that's that's the basic plot of the thing and now he's like risking his life his family's well-being um to get tetris properly licensed um in japan and it's i'm not going to give away the whole story but like it it dives into him meeting with nintendo and talking about getting it boxed with Game Boy and what that relationship, like that was obviously the big end goal. One of the plot twists that created that big end goal that like, if we can get this onto Game Boy and get it packaged with Game Boy, it's going to take off. And we know where that story ends, obviously. Um, but it's, it's, it's fascinating to watch, not just for the nostalgic purposes of, of seeing Tetra and Tetris and, and, and how it, how it came about. Um, but also to watch it go through those steps and like these battling of mindsets and economic practices. Uh, it's a, it's a great film. I thought it was very well, very well acted. Um, like character develop, like it's one of those movies similar to Oppenheimer where it takes something so mundane Somebody had to sit down and say, hey, we're going to make a movie about the licensing rights to a video game. Yeah, it's not I, about the development of the video game. It's about licensing a video game. And they knocked it out of the park and grabbing my intention. Yeah, I feel like whoever pitched that idea initially was like, I really, really, really love Tetris. I wonder if I can get a movie made. And then they finally got in front of a studio exec and they're like, so what are you thinking? And they're like, what are your thoughts on Tetris? And then the studio exec is like, oh, are you thinking a documentary? That could be good. And they're like, we're on a related note. How do you feel about Mission Impossible? <laughs> and then they jammed them together into the movie. And it's like a spy thriller based on Tetris. Uh, I don't know how that got through a bunch of studio execs, but I'm glad it did because I was very entertained. I'd even watch it again because it was entertaining. Uh, so I totally agree. It certainly kept my attention. Mm -hmm. I, it feels a little bit like how I felt watching Woman in Gold. So this is the Helen Mirren, Ryan Reynolds. Ryan Reynolds is a, long, a young lawyer and uh Helen Mirren plays this woman, an elderly Jewish woman, and they're trying to reclaim a painting that was Gustav Klimt's famous lady in gold painting, which was in her family, and she's trying to get it back. Um, it was seized by the Nazis. So they, it's like they infuse this war story into somebody trying to get their painting back. Famous painting. Fascinating story, but like not what you'd think Ryan Reynolds, Helen Mirren. Uh, Katie Holmes, Elizabeth McGovern, Daniel Bruhl. Uh, he's the guy who plays. Uh, oh, Dylan, he's in. Uh, he's the villain in the. Yeah, Avengers Ultron, Avengers. Age of Ultron. Yeah, Age of Ultron. Anyway, feels like really like a legal dispute of a painting. OK, I mean, cool, but it's like fascinating. It's such a good watch. Yeah, I need to watch Tetris now. Uh, I watched uh, Twisters on my birthday. Uh, yeah. I had been really wanting to see it. I know it's like kind of out of theaters or maybe like just finally leaving theaters, but the sequel to the classic Twister. Um, and my son had the reaction that I had after seeing the first. And he said, Dad, that movie made me fascinated with tornadoes. And I said, exactly. Like, if you're a kid in the 90s or whenever Twister came out and aren't fascinated by tornadoes and how they work and the concept of chasing them and like storm chasers that was such a great movie uh and the the sequel felt a lot like that it has a lot of the same you you feel a lot of the same way watching it they did a really good job bringing that sort of 
life to it, but making it exciting for a new generation of viewer. Uh, so if you like Twister, definitely watch Twisters. Um, and everybody's crushing on the male lead in that now. Uh, the dude from Top Gun Maverick. Um, yeah, he's been in a bunch of stuff. Blanking on his name right now, but all the girls love him. Glenn he, Powell. Glenn Powell. He's got a little bit of the Rat Boy Summer look. Squinty eyes. Mm. Uh, squinty eyes. Pointy features. Um, maybe. Maybe Mal not. Nourished. No, I think he's just not malnourished. Objectively handsome. Forget what I just said. Okay, <laughs> I'm here for it. Anyway, yeah. that's all I've been watching. Dylan, how about you? Uh, I have to. I don't normally do this, but I have to say something that I said was worth watching now feels like it's not worth watching. Oof. And uh, not because it wasn't fine, but because, like we've discussed before, too many things get canceled too soon. Oof. And The Acolyte, Disney Plus's newest series uh, about the High Republic and Star Wars, did not get renewed for a second season and ended on a cliffhanger. And I feel like the bad, quote, read from Disney is going to be like, oh, people just aren't interested in a different era in the Star Wars galaxy. We should jam 47 more titles into the existing timeline and stories is going to be the read. And I think that's the wrong read. I think it just takes people some time. And I think they just spent too much money making that season. And they're going to blame audiences when it's really their own fault. So it ended on a cliffhanger uh, season one, which apparently is now just the only season and uh, not worth watching. I, the only thing I think that might make sense is if a bunch of people said, Dylan, you're dumb and they go watch it anyways. And maybe Disney sees streaming numbers on the back end over time that like, maybe it would be worth it, but I don't think so. I think it's just dead. And uh, it's a bummer because it was interesting. I know it got some flack because it had whatever going for it or not going for it. Not worth getting into. You can read the internet, but uh, it was worthwhile. There was some cool stuff in it and it was worth watching uh, originally, but can't say that it is now with a canceled uh, uh, canceled storyline. So there's that for what it's worth. If you haven't watched Acolyte, you can probably skip it now. Bummer feels like a fitting word because it's like if you're I mean, you're Disney, you've got deep pockets, but like. You could be the visionary behind it and know that there's a there there and you're like, I know people will get interested if I just but you're asking a lot of people in a time when, as we've said on the show many times, there's so much to watch. Like, yes, that's true. People could get into it if it were the only bit of Star Wars content out there, if it were on a major couple streaming platforms or networks or two, there's a hundred. Um, like how long, and I'm, I'm putting myself in that, like I'm putting myself in the shoes of like a, uh, Dave Filoni or a guy who's like, no, I, I know there's something to this story in a different era where nobody knows the characters. You're asking a lot of people, how long do you give them to sort of, and I've not seen the show. So I'm, I have no, no, uh, I'm just talking totally out of my, you know what, as I did about virtual races, but <laughs> you go like, how long do you just, do you hang on and go, no, they'll, They'll get it. And they'll, because nobody knew a new hope either in 1977. And no one knew what Tatooine was or the dark side or the light side. And nobody knew any of that either. But there was a very different time. There was a lot less to watch, especially a lot less to watch in that category, that genre. It's just a shame because, as you're saying, it seems like there's a good and compelling story there. But it just feels like you're asking too much of people to commit. Hey, no, if we made another two or three seasons, then you'll really start to like it. And then we can make rides and merchandise and stuff off of these characters that you also didn't know three seasons ago. Does that feel true? I don't know. You watched it. Yeah. And, and I don't need to like dig into some of the complaints, legitimate or illegitimate. The advantage that I have is that I don't have to think about the budget and the marketing of the whole thing. Right. Yeah. So like I can just take the content for what it is. And it sure it was a little bit of a slow start, but it was certainly a worthwhile second half of 
the only season and the cliffhanger that they left it on and some of the characters were very compelling even for only just having been introduced the advantage that the show had was you didn't need to really know anything about anything going in other than jedi good sith bad or there's good guys and bad guys and that was all you needed to know and there was, and if you know, Jedi have lightsabers, lightsaber battles, cool. <laughs> that was enough to like get into the show and, and just sort of pick it up as it went on. And there was some really, really great acting that did happen in the show. So it's a bummer um, that it sort of bit the dust. I think they'll get, I think they'll learn the, the wrong lesson here, unfortunately, um, which has felt true on a couple of projects. But then you have Andor that's like kind of like Rogue One the fan base seems to like Andor as much or similarly to how they like rogue one and it's getting another season, which is already wrapped and will likely go again if, if they can. So, um, you know, you win some, you lose some Mandalorian and Ahsoka were generally well-received book of Boba Fett less. So, uh, I think the reality is that, like I said, they'll win some, they'll lose some, but this, because it was in a whole new era, felt like you're abandoning something that does need some time to build up and, you know, it kind of it kind of goes to what I've said before. You, if you're going to start something, you at least at least need to try to budget to resolve it, especially when a story you're asking people to sign up for your app to come watch this show. And then you build up to a cliffhanger and then you say cancel. Then, you know, you pitch people on this thing. It's up to you to resolve it. It's, if you claim your storytellers and you claim you care about your audience, it's up to you to resolve it for them because you sold yeah. them. So, uh, Again, I don't have to think about budgets, right? I don't, I'm not sending it yeah. Disney saying that we lost, you know, a hundred million dollars on this show or whatever. So, like, that's easy for me to say. But uh, I wonder if, from a marketing perspective, if there's some of these things like that one feels like it might have been more successful if they released it as a feature film. That's and, one uh, of the complaints. Formatted it that way because because that way, like you're. In a way, the the people who are going to start watching it, very few people walk out in the middle of a movie. So you're forcing them to see the storyline yeah. through um, all the way up to the cliffhanger. And then now you can market the next plot. Um, but you're also getting it in front of the eyes of people, especially then if you market this feature film to people who are saying, hey, you like the Star Wars content that we've made before, and maybe you haven't done all of the streaming stuff, mm -hmm. this is a Star Wars product for you to come see where it doesn't matter if you haven't seen Bad Batch. Like, come in and, and you can watch this film. I, I, I feel like, like, and then do a series after that if, if that's what you want to do, if you want to put it on a streaming platform where you can, like, really rack up the views. Um, but started as a feature film, I feel like I, I wonder if that would be a better way to introduce something new. Yeah. To, to speak to that point and then circle back to us discussing hot ones. There's a video that's kind of made its rounds of Matt Damon talking about the importance of pre-streaming of um, DVD and VHS, VHS sales and things like that, validating the investment into stories that wouldn't normally get told because you could lose in the theater, but win after and streaming has taken away mm. that whole piece of the pie and the risk is up because you're investing up front, hoping that it pays off in subscribers. And I think when you run that idea alongside different platforms from my limited point of view have different strategies that make sense for them and not for other streamers. Um, it doesn't, for me, it doesn't make sense for Netflix to care about movies in theaters. It does make sense for Disney to care about putting their movies in theaters. So I think Disney has been trying to mimic Netflix when Disney should be saying, we're going to make movies uh, for the theater, Disney, Pixar, Marvel, Star Wars, and then quickly funnel them to our app. You know, once people go buy it digitally and go buy it in release that they want and then quickly get it into the app 
so that we can push people to go see these movies. It, it feels like they're trying to cop. Everyone's trying to copy Netflix when different platforms feel conducive to different types of um, sort of pushes to consumers. HBO feels kind of like Netflix. It makes sense to me for them to push content just to their channel and then to the streaming app and say, you got to pay for us one way or the other. You can pay through cable or you can pay through streaming where that's also different than Disney, where Disney gets their money in the theater and then wants to try to sell some movies and then get it back in streaming. So I think they're just like pacing and editing was certainly one of the complaints on Acolyte. Maybe it should have been a movie if it had been a two and a half hour film. You know, maybe it it could have been four months down the road, pushed to Disney Plus, and then they could have justified a follow up movie or series. You know, again, I'm sure they have lots of market research that inform all of that stuff. But from my point of view, it's like I think some of these guys are just thinking they all need to be doing what everyone else is doing when it seems like they should be doing what makes most the most sense for their audience and and content. Yeah, for heaven's sakes, like don't don't try to emulate the streaming service that has been bleeding market share. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, and they all they all have very different core offerings. One started as a platform to stream stuff and didn't even make content. One has been making content and stories for a hundred years. Yeah. <laughs> they're very different things. And so they can cannibalize their own businesses if they're not careful. Uh, but yeah, it now but, Netflix is making their own content and they have their own studios. Anyway, I'm I'm not them and I don't pretend pretend to understand it, but I feel like Disney could rebrand the idea of the Disney vault as Disney plus we're going to put these movies out in theaters and then you can go buy them. But if you really want access, get Disney plus that's the Disney vault. That's where all the content lives. Yeah. And if you want everything go there, if you just want to buy a movie here or see a movie there, go see it in theaters. That's your chance. Buy it. That's your chance or get it all. Well, but. some of us don't just stream. Some of us actually read. And I took my family <laughs> to a bookstore and got a comic book. <laughs> it's not but reading. No, it's not at all. It's <laughs> not at all reading. It's like saying that you read a book when you just listen to the audio book. Um, but no, if you've not, if you're in Central Ohio and you don't know anything about the book loft in German Village, uh, oh, that's yeah. a fun time. And I went it on is. Sunday afternoon. We grabbed lunch after church. Lily brought a friend. If you don't know, it's this old timey house in the heart of German village in Columbus. That's got 32 rooms that are themed, uh, room. It's a bookstore. It's not like you're not renting. It's not a library. You're buying books. Um, some used, but like so much fun. I didn't realize there'd be a line out the door. Uh, then I thought, oh, it is move-in week at Ohio State. There is a lot of people in town. It is right by Children's Hospital. And I learned that a lot of people visiting do that before or after visiting people. So there was a line out the door. But other than that, it was a great time. And you guys know I've been talking about The Last Ronin. This is a spinoff story about one of the four Ninja Turtles. His brothers have been killed or have died and he is avenging their death, but you don't know which one it is. And it was a series of regular sized comic books, but the story is now completed. So I got the hardback full story here and I'm so excited to learn which turtle this is uh, avenging his brothers. But it's I read the first one. It's really good. Just just blew up my microphone. So. Bye. Cool, cool, cool. <laughs> Friends, <clears throat> my beard right now. You know, it's so, it smells like sandalwood. Yeah, I've revisited the sandalwood. To be honest, I'm going to go back to the citrus fire after I use up the sandalwood. The sandalwood is not bad, but the citrus fire for me is fire. And uh, you know what? If you go to artiusman.com, A R T I U S man.com. There's, they actually have sample packs that you can buy. Did you know this? You can get like a bunch of beard oils and all kinds of different flavors. If you will, don't eat the beard oil. I meant to say aromas. And uh, you can try all these things out for yourself relatively cheaply. And then you have a bunch of little travel bottles that you can hang on to. And then when you're trying to shove things into your one quart bag for your carry-on, 
you have a smaller bottle that you can put your beard oil into, you should go over to rdsman.com, load up your cart with sample size bottles, and then figure out what your scent is. They have a lot of them. They are good scents. They're not using the cheap fragrances that everybody else does. They're using actual oils and good materials to make their products. They are a responsible company. They're a local to us company. We know the guy who started the company. He's been on our show. He is a solid dude. His name's Jeff. And uh, you should buy stuff from them. And when you do so, on your first order, make sure you put the middle in the discount code box thing. And you're going to save 25% off of your first order. And so it's good for you. Um, It's good for the podcast. And it's good for our friend Jeff and the people who work with him over there at RDS Man. Good people. Good products. Anything else, guys? That's it. All right. See you later. Bye.